Okay. Um, right, it's three minutes past 11. So we may as well do a start. Um, and as I said, the aim of this meeting is to learn a bit about what it's like going to court, but also be inspired and motivated and filled with love for these people that have stood up in court and spoke their truth to power. And um, I wonder if somebody would like to start with a with a prayer. Is anyone up for that? I can, that's fine. Creator God, we exist because you made us. The world exists because you made it out of love. Give us what we need, Lord, to um, do our duty in terms of rejoicing in what you have made and protecting what you have made. And in this little space, a little bit of space and time we have now, let us listen for your spirit, for your truth, for your love um, in, in this time and let us be motivated, let us be inspired to carry on this work we have been given. Amen. Right, so, um, so who wants to go first? Helen, Mark and Sue have all spoken. Helen, would you like to go first? Hello, good morning. My internet's really poor, but so I slightly missed the introduction, Ruth. But yes, I'd happily to go first if you tell me what it is you want me to go first at. <laughs> okay. <Talk> um, <laughs> the, aim, the, the aim of this morning is to be inspired and, and, and just, just have that moment to listen to you speaking your statements that you gave in court. But if you could start, give, give a little sort of background to it about what it's like being in court, maybe what you how you felt when you woke up that morning or um, just a bit of background to, to why you were there and then you can just read your statement, I guess. Okay. Thank you. Okay. The bit that I did catch with was you talking about how anxious you feel. And I found that really reassuring because I think of you as this kind of, I don't know, it's really hard for you, but I think of you as this kind of person who's so used to it. And I thought it must, maybe you could just get used to it um, when I think about you. Um, I was, um, I felt sick for two weeks before my court case. I felt sick every morning when I got up um, and I felt sick on the day. Um, and I think it's really important to say that because I know that on the outside, we all look fine. And so we look, you know, full of confidence and what have you, but I felt uh, my stomach was turning and all of that. So there was a long, long gap between my arrest and my court case. So for a long time, it sort of just went into abeyance. So I went from the kind of um, the fear and anxiety into, well, you know, put it on the back burner um, because it was put on the back burner in terms of its case, of the case itself. Um, there was a, a horrible pit of the stomach moment when the, the official letter came through with all the things at the top about court appearances and you know you can't quite believe you're the person receiving that letter um so there were little moments like that and then it was really in the run-up um I was hugely blessed because I was I knew I would be in court with Mark so we were arrested at the same time and we we're going to be in court together and that was great because we were working on it together so I wasn't alone in this and we were also given some pro bono help um which was also hugely reassuring to talk to um, a, an expert in the field who helped us uh, and, and Mark really grasped all of that better than I did, I think. Um, so we had, we had the sort of sense of solidarity there um, from the beginning, from the moment that we both decided to stay on the pavement to the moment we stood up in court, there was a sort of bond between us. <clears throat> and I think I didn't achieve in court the sense of calm and centeredness and rightness of this whole episode that I had achieved at the point of being arrested. So at the point of being arrested, I felt that that I was in the right place and that it was holy ground. It didn't feel like that in court um, because it wasn't. <laughs> you know, we were having to subject ourselves to a system that doesn't 
recognize the um, things that we were recognizing in our actions in the protest. So is that useful? I'm slightly concerned that people are coming and going and Ruth seems to have frozen now. Can, can someone put their thumb up that they can hear me? Oh, good. <laughs> Everyone looks so serious and very, very static. I thought maybe I was talking into nothingness. Um, okay. And I also would just like to say I found it hugely, hugely helpful to write the statement because it made me do the theology. It made me do the theology of what we were up to. And so writing down what I wanted to say and knowing that because we were pleading not guilty, we'd get the opportunity to make those statements felt like one of the most important parts of what we were doing. We knew it was extremely likely that um, we would be found guilty. Um, we knew some of our antecedents, so we knew what to quote in terms of Ziegler and that sort of thing. We were well briefed on that, but it was the opportunity to publicly pronounce the reasons. So the statement I first wrote in the police cell through the night after the arrest um, formed the basis of what I then evolved really over the 18 months in between about thinking hard and deeply about why we do these things. And I feel more strongly than ever that in at the right moment to put oneself in a position where one might be arrested is the right thing to do because do you know what? The world is rubbish. <laughs> and I just feel this, we're so far from any form of kingdom that the, the laws of the world are just, yeah, no longer the ones I wish to live by and, and the things that are pronounced in the name of this nation are no longer, oh, I don't think they ever have been, but certainly increasingly not ones I wish to live by. And I know that I am as much guilty of that as anybody else. We're just miles from kingdom. And so, yeah. And in terms of the arrest, it was simply seemed like the right moment. In a way, I find it, I'm amazed by people who can decide that an action ahead of time and plan and plan and plan. For me, it was, this is when I stay. This is when I do not move my body. But that comes across in the statement, probably. And do you want me to read the whole of it? Yes, no, somebody, I've gone again, have I? Have you lost me? Yes, okay, all right. So you want me to read my statement? from start to finish. Okay, here we go. So we'd gone through uh, the rigmarole and um, we couldn't sit next to each other. So Mark and I were in different places and it was quite hard to have eye contact. And I was in a magistrate's court. So I had three um, women magistrates listening and we were invited to sum up. And so this was my closing statement on March the 25th of this year. This is the first week of Passion Tide, a time in the Christian year when the truth is revealed. And this trial began with an oath on a Bible, the sacred text that teaches a radical way of love and which includes the account of Jesus before Pilate when he famously replied, what is truth? before falling silent in the face of a justice system that had nothing of real truth and justice to offer him. Well, I'm afraid you're not going to have silence from me and I hope you can offer more than pilot. Here is my truth, the truth of thousands of activists, the truth of millions too busy trying to survive, too busy grieving, too busy coping with the real life effects of the climate and ecological emergency. On October the 7th, 2019, I was sitting on the ground. For that brief spell, a small patch of Millbank was holy ground. Holy ground being held against all odds, against the state, against ecocide, against corporate power, against self-serving politics, against a fossil fuel economy, and against all that contrives to damage our earth 
and its fragile web of life. Against all that desecrates the sacred. And for a brief moment, there was full autonomy. I held tight to love and to a tenacious hope. What a contrast to this space. Mark and I stand before you, two priests, people of faith, who sat in the road for their beliefs. We stand here charged and brought to court while governments and corporations go unchallenged on countless charges of ecocide. During the course of that day on October the 17th, I gave an interview to the Daily Telegraph, to Christian Premier Radio, spoke alongside representatives of faith-based NGOs, led prayers in a multi-faith gathering on a bridge that was blocked by police, helped to carry an enormous ark, a striking symbol of hope in the face of despair. I had multiple conversations with multiple people who love and care for this planet and the people who live on it. And then I sat with people I'd never met before in solidarity with our neighbours on the other side of the globe. And I prayed prayed in the deepest, most profound way that happens only when all else seems lost and we touch the very heart of the matter. What kind of a mad world is it that has two vicars who can see and understand the catastrophic harm to human, animal and plant life that is the climate catastrophe standing in a dock before you for telling the truth about an existential threat. We have looked into the abyss, seen the despair, and our hope is to find agency in whatever way we can through action and contemplation to do something before we die for a world that is dying. As I prayed, a young woman sang Bread and Roses. I want bread and roses for the world. Beauty and sustenance, a sharing of life's glories, glories that should be available to all. A stranger prayed for me and blessed me, and a police officer repeatedly said, that he didn't want to arrest me, called me padre and begged me to desist because his girlfriend would never forgive him for arresting me. Today, 17 months later, is my eldest son's 30th birthday. He is living through a pandemic that is caused by the catastrophic effects of the minority world lifestyle of which I am a part. In the course of his life, I have marched, signed petitions, written letters, educated myself and many others, and been a teacher, mother and priest. That vocation commits me to the fierce love and protection of my children and of, by extension, the children of the world. As a priest in the Anglican Communion, my vocation brings a commitment to the fifth mark of mission, which is to strive to safeguard the integrity of creation and sustain and renew the life of the earth. This duty I hold in common with Christians across the globe, linked by a faith that demands love for neighbour and where necessary, demands personal sacrifice. As vicars, we have the cure of souls. That's not some mere ephemera that flies off to heaven. It's the fully integrated body and spirit, the spiritual and physical well-being of the people in our parishes. 
with a care also for creation that then extends to the soil, the trees, and all that lies within our parish. I am called to pastoral care for people and planet in the place of my work in the parish of Cholden, where I preach that we must love our neighbour and that our neighbour is not just the person we can see, but the person we cannot see in Bangladesh, in the Niger Delta, in the Maldives, wherever people are suffering as we speak from catastrophic climate change. On their behalf, I claim immediate and urgent necessity. They are my neighbour. To pass by on the other side as a member of the minority world that created the catastrophe is not an option. My faith compels me to love my neighbour, to cross over even when it is dangerous to do so not to turn a blind eye to the truth and pass on the other side. By demanding action on climate change, I am exercising my faith. By praying as I take action, I am exercising my right to a freedom of worship in Article 9 of the European Convention on Human Rights and to assemble with others in solidarity under Article 11 of the same convention. When governments won't listen, when profit is the golden calf and we can modify every part of the planet, when we are crucifying our earth, a crucified earth that will not have a risen life, when on the current trajectory, this crucified earth will come to an end and take with it millions of souls for whom I wish to advocate, then the imperative must be to act. That imperative to love ferociously culminated for me in a moment of deep clarity and deep prayer on Monday, October the 7th, 2019. I knew that all that I had left at that moment between myself and the appalling climate injustice of this world was my body to place between the oncoming disaster and the powers that be. My body on the line in the face of the social and economic structures that prevail, in the face of the, of the systemic refusal to face this disaster, this disaster with honesty and with immediate action. And so I prayed, and my prayer was protest. That is a right enshrined in law, a right to be exercised in an emergency. I did this on behalf of those who are in immediate danger, and I did this for my own children and godchildren, for the children in my church and in my church school, all of whom will witness in their lifetimes what happens beyond the cliff edge. Ultimately, my faith and my understanding of the world convinces me that love must prevail. So today, when secular laws fail in their duty to protect our earth, I am compelled to turn to a higher moral and spiritual authority. This court could have the courage and has the capacity to do the same. Yes, 17 months ago I sat in the road. It was a tiny, minuscule moment in the greater scheme of things. Since then, no change has been effected. It was my only remaining option in the face of massive negligence. I will now close with the words of the late Polly Higgins. The rules of our world are laws and they can be changed. Laws can restrict or they can enable. 
What matters is what they serve. Many of the laws in our world serve property. They're based on ownership. But imagine a law that has a higher moral authority, a law that puts people and planet first. Imagine a law that starts from first do no harm, that stops this dangerous game and takes us to a place of safety. Will this court begin that journey towards a place of safety for all people today. Wow, thank you, Helen. Did you get flashbacks? Very much so. I wasn't, yes, I'm, I came to this in a bit of a rush and I wasn't quite expecting, <laughs> expecting that. Absolutely. My knees were wobbling at the time. Um, and yeah, it's when you actually have to say really deep down why you're doing what you're doing. And you must know that so much better than me. But for me, that was just the, mo I, you know, what, I don't know, you just have to be able to say it and to have to think it through and to have to put it together um, is it's it's formative as well of course it's formative um, yeah yeah thank you for listening it's felt awfully long <laughs> oh my these poor people <laughs> <laughs> need to listen to me <laughs> um what do people want to do? Do people want to ask questions of Helen now? Or do we want to hear Mark's um, statement and then go into groups? Um, what do you think, people? Sarah, what do you think? Um, well, I did have one question. What, on. What's the outcome? I probably have read this, but what happened? <laughs> Uh, we were found not guilty. They went. They did. Go, they, did us, they, they did us. They did us. We were found. Sorry, we were found guilty. They did us the honour of disappearing for longer than usual. So you know, I think Mark and I both thought maybe we made them stop and think a bit. But basically, we were found not guilty. Yes, and guilty. given the minimum. Please. Guilty. Oh, sorry. We're pleading not guilty. We we're found guilty. I'm sorry for the record of this recording. I am now a criminal. There you go. Yeah. Sorry, Any, I'm not speaking straight. <laughs> Any other questions? So if we go to Mark, Mark, if you take um Helen took Cordovina, if you take Cordovina, then we Oops. still do have, you know, 10 minutes, 15 minutes for, for group. So um that would be fine. Do you think everybody? Yeah? Okay. Okay, Mark, go ahead. Floor is yours. The courtroom you, is you. yours. Um, you can imagine when Helen delivered that statement in the court. I mean, there weren't many of us in that funny little courtroom. Uh, you really could hear a pin drop. I was completely, as I was just now, you know, in that funny zone where you're, you're sort of frozen in space, you're disembodied. And um, so Helen's statement was and is amazing. And I am so happy that I sat next to this priest sitting on the road on October the 7th, 2019. Uh, so that uh, was a great thing. Um, but before, and I've only just finished my statement, I, I had some notes, but I knew actually, as I put all my effort into the legal stuff, foolishly, because it didn't get us anywhere, but you know, we, we did our best on the legal stuff, um, that actually Helen was gonna say it all and she has said it all beautifully, but, but still important to do your own statements. I've just completed it this morning, <laughs> better late than never. But uh, just a, a few things on the court business, because you're right, although maybe Ruth and Helen and, and certainly Sue, you know, you get more used to this sort of thing. It, all these institutions are designed to be terrifying and they are, aren't they? What do you call them? Uh, is it your worship or sir or madam? Or do you stand up or sit down and uh, what's he doing there in the corner and uh, but then then there is a point where I you you get to it and you just you're just compassionately compassionately 
not taking it seriously, too seriously. So the, the, the barrister was pretty hopeless, wasn't she? She didn't have, her equipment didn't work. Do you remember, Helen? And, uh, you know, so you begin to see the humans behind all these roles. Um, so I, I thank God for the grace that we didn't take it too seriously. But yeah, um, all that stuff. So here's my statement, which I think is much shorter because um, we, it's all been said before, but still, uh, uh, it's worth saying. Your worships, I have in my hand here the document which the Bishop of Manchester, in, in which the Bishop of Manchester invited me to share with him the cure of souls of the parish of St. Chad, St. Mary in the Borm and St. Edmund Rochdale. When I was arrested, I held that responsibility for the care and the well-being of those precious people in that northern mill town. They are, and they, they were, and they still are, God's own people. I believe Jesus died for them out of love, although they were not even a twinkle in, the, in their parents' eyes at that time. Um, their hard work has developed much of the wealth of this country throughout the Industrial Revolution. The charge by the bishop to have their, the cure of their souls means to care for their well-being, both spiritual and material. The terrible floods in Rochdale of Boxing Day 2015 showed to me how much they were at risk from climate change and ecological degradation. I sat on the highway, it is true. We have laid before you a defence that says it was not actually obstruction of the highway, but I sat on that road with the Reverend Helen and I was doing it as the parish priest of those two parishes in Rochdale. Hopefully, we all get through life and learn some wisdom along the way. We learn how to love and do less of the damaging things to each other. But on a dying planet and in a collapsing civilization, there wouldn't be much space for that journey of wisdom and grace and for the chance to grow in a bit of maturity and truth. My job as a parish priest is to help people to grow closer to Jesus Christ. And that needs a certain society, certain stability to exist. Your worships, you have heard many people say they have lobbied MPs and sent letters. I've done all that too. I want to tell you about some moments on that journey. I remember, remember inviting Bob Waring MP. I wasn't sure whether to tell them how much the local people hated him. Uh, to, the, to the Church of St. Christopher's, I invited Stephen Twigg and he came to church and spoke. Uh, then in Rochdale, I met Simon Danchuk. I don't think I should mention his sexual shenanigans, do you? Uh, oh, it's being recorded. Uh, Tony Lloyd, very supportive. We had tea in Parliament with Tony Lloyd. They were each very generous and appeared to take the matter very seriously, and they genuinely did. But nothing has happened. Uh, the emissions have continued to increase. Nothing has worked. Your worships, my wife Wendy is an Australian. Her family can be traced back to clog makers in Salford. Perhaps somewhere along the line, it's not quite clear from the family history. One of them committed a misdemeanor and came before your predecessors on a northern bench before deportation to Australia. You will have heard about and seen the pictures of those uh, bushfires in Australia. I cannot shake from my mind the image of that orange glow a number of her family had to evacuate from their town. Rescue is surely part of the purpose of our Christian ministry. Like our faith is about salvation, rescuing us from death. Life is a precious thing and we are called to live it in abundance. So I did this action as a Christian, as a follower of Jesus in the church. We call it discipleship in our own special language. Sometimes people say nowadays that people like me are virtue signalling. I'm willing to run the risk that I've got it all wrong in some way. I'd love it to be discovered if it was true that climate change was a myth all made up, all made up by the lefties. But I could not bear the thought that I'd not acted at this existential threat because it's, the scientists tell us it's true. It needs a bit more work that bit. The prophet Micah said, love mercy and do justice, and Jesus seems to show that in his life. It's that sort of life that I wish to emulate. In my own small way, sitting on that road was a step along that journey. It was also a message to, to my MP in that parliament, just a couple of hundred yards away. I went to a decent private school. My parents worked hard to give us a good education and had hopes of a prof professional career for me. I remember my father saying to me whilst walking the dog on the beach, 
What's it to be, son, medicine or law? Well, I chose the law happily for those with medical ailments. Um, and then the church chose me after that. Um, I've done my best to present to you the legal defences. We think they're compelling. I'm a great fan of the law. It does so many good things. It has a great way of analysing, structuring and deciding things. Much as I love the law, I, I think we should remember that it is a construction, something we have made up to help hold our civilization together. It has deep roots, a lot of wisdom and a lot of experience in it. I'm grateful for it. But if the law cannot protect human life, then it is failing. Ultimately, I owe obedience to Jesus Christ. He is my, my Lord. He is the one I follow. I want the law to keep us all alive and protect the precious life that God has given us. We have a great capacity to double think, to do good with one hand and evil with the other and not connect the two. Even our own John Newton, I think, who wrote Amazing Grace, was a man of faith and a big slave owner. We've now got to join it all together and face up to the truth and we must love one another and that means telling the truth about the climate emergency and not letting people die. So I ask you, worships to find us not guilty. Thank you, Mark. Great place to throw in the fact you're a lawyer. <laughs> Great. Anyone got any questions for Mark? Jim. Can you clarify, Mark, you said that you um, finished that this morning. So did that mean you did or didn't make a statement in court? I didn't make a statement in court. Um, I think we knew, I think I knew it wasn't quite necessary and I knew Helen was going to do a cracking one. Um, the, I'd heard various stories about, you know, people not being cut short. I mean, mercifully, we each contributed and it was all heard so but you did say you did you did say something mark not in court i mean I, I did the, uh, more defend i mean i i led a bit on the legal defense there we go that's what i mean yeah so you were yeah. you you this, you're you didn't do a summing up but you did some stuff before that absolutely no we, we were a mark did a lot of the stuff yeah yeah he did all the stuff around ziegler and and remembered the clauses that i couldn't remember and and did, did did lots of that and you challenged the prosecution very effectively you know and we made them you gave them a run for their money so you you, you know yeah he was he was not silent okay do you want to just quickly so, so the, the the sort of agenda of a court case is you you put your defense they put the prosecution case and then you just put the defense case and then you do the summing up is that what, how it works Yes, I, I can't remember much more without looking at notes. It's all a bit of a blur now, but it's 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 not rocket science. Okay, and um, I think one of the things was to try and own the space, wasn't it? And you know, to say we we do know roughly what's going on, hmm. <laughs> and you know, make it a bit less alien, which Art was very good at with his background. Hmm. 